Good afternoon, everybody. Well, thanks so much for coming to this very special Smiley Professional event. And I'm Dr. Martin, the director of the Anderson Classroom to Career Center at the School of Business and Economics here at UW Stevens Point. So it's great to see such a good turnout today. And something new that we're doing for today's event is we are also live streaming it. So we expect that we have some students perhaps from our uh, Marshfield and Wausau campuses and perhaps even other locations as well joining us live. So that's terrific. And I also want to make sure that we thank all of our sponsors and supporters for making today's event possible starting with the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership, which is based at UW-Madison, and they fund speakers from speaker events across the state to promote local discussions of leadership and policymaking solutions in Wisconsin and beyond. So we are very honored to have today's event included in the prestigious Thompson Center Speaker Series. We're also very grateful to our generous School of Business and Economics alumni, especially Keith and Tammy Anderson, Mark and Julie Smiley, and the Ray Munt family. Now, before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to have a few announcements or reminders for our students here. Uh, there will be a few minutes at the end for questions with our guest speaker, so be thinking of those. We will also be doing a book giveaway at the end of today's event and more details on that coming a little bit later. For those of you who are, who are here in person, we're going to do attendance at the end of the event and there'll be three stations set up so should things should move along pretty quickly. And if you are again joining us via the live stream on zoom your attendance will be taken through the Zoom login system. So nothing you need to do about that. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Liz Nilsson. Liz is the Associate Director of the Agile Strategy Lab at the University of North Alabama, as well as the Director of Operations at the Strategic Doing Institute and co-author of the award-winning 2019 book, Strategic Doing, 10 Skills for Agile Leadership. Liz earned a BA in History from Stanford University and an MBA from the College of Business at Northeastern University. And she's not done yet. She's currently pursuing a PhD in Organizational Leadership from Eastern University. Liz has extensive experience in business and higher education She's led various STEM initiatives at the local, regional, and state levels. She has nonprofit experience where she designed programs, did fundraising, and she's authored a number of research articles as well as publications on building community vitality. Now, her talk today is entitled Leadership is a Verb, Not a Noun. And she's going to be explaining how you as students and soon to be graduates can show leadership, even in the beginning of your careers by using the strategic doing way of thinking. So now please help me welcome Liz Nilsson. Thanks. Okay, first job is the sound on. Yes, okay, good, all right. Um, Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you all this afternoon. Uh, first, I want to get a little sense of who's in the room. So could you raise your hands if you are a first or second year student? Okay, good point. If you're a third year student, if you're about to be out of here. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, how many of you are uh, from, let's say, 20 miles away or less? Okay. Anybody here from outside the United States? Okay, a couple, okay. How many of you have had work experience in a for-profit company that you don't own? <laughs> okay. How many of you are entrepreneurs? That you have something you do on the side that makes money? I know there's a few of you, okay. How many of you have worked for a nonprofit organization? Okay. 
see what am I missing? How many of you have worked for some kind of government, state or local? A few, okay. Have I missed anything? What kind of organizations did I miss? Anything? Okay, all right. So um, I'm delighted to be here to talk a little bit about what we do and more particularly about ways in which uh, you can uh, be leaders in your careers even as you're just starting out, even right now, if you're uh, already in the work world. So we're going to do a combination of kind of different sorts of things today. Uh, and uh, we're going to have some uh, uh, interactive opportunities so don't go to sleep. Uh, and uh, Adam's got some supplies that at some point he will hand out if he hasn't already, because uh, we're going to do some exercises together. Okay. Let me tell you kind of where we're going here. So uh, we're going to start out with, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. So you're probably wondering why I'm here and what makes me qualified to talk to you today. Uh, we're going to talk about a few big ideas that we use in our training and the work that we do. Uh, I'm going to use an extended metaphor. So if you're a metaphor person, you're in good, in good place today. And then we'll have time at the end for questions that I will try to answer. So uh, before I tell you kind of about where I come from, I'm the associate director, Dr. Martin said this, I'm the associate director of the Agile Strategy Lab at the University of North Alabama, which is a really long title. Uh, and to further complicate things, I'm not actually in Alabama. So I live in Baltimore, I work remotely. Uh, at the Agile Strategy Lab, we help individuals and organizations find better ways to collaborate in networks where there is no one person who can tell everybody what to do. Okay? Sometimes we have jobs where there is one person who can tell everybody what to do, but a lot of the times that's not true, and that's increasingly not true. But most of the ways that uh, those of us who have been in the work world for a while, most of the ways that we learned how to lead, we learned assuming that we would be able to tell people what to do. And so a lot of our work is around helping people find new ways uh, to do their work together. Uh, so I do, I do training and uh, teaching. Uh, right now we teach both at the undergraduate and the graduate level. And I do a lot of continuing education where I get to go around the country and, and teach people. Uh, we do things that look like consulting, although we try not to use the word consulting. We try to say, we're here to give you skills that you can use after we're gone, uh, rather than say it's a consulting kind of thing. Uh, we do that. We do writing, obviously, we've got a book. Uh, and we do some research on the work that we do to make sure that we're being effective with it. So that's kind of what I do. All right, so here's a little bit about me. Now, when you heard the, the sort of the introduction, you might have thought, well, she went to Stanford. So obviously her career path has been like the Autobahn, right? Straight, fast, let's go, okay? This is not the case, okay? Much more like this, I would say, okay? Let me tell you about some of the jobs I've had. This is in order. I've left a couple out, but not very many. My first job out of college, I was a solid waste program specialist. That's like the people who take the garbage to the dumps. Okay? That was my first job. Really exciting, let me tell you. Uh, then I was a professional thank you letter writer. Really a boring job. You do not want that job. Uh, then I was a fundraiser. So I was a fundraiser at the school where I had been writing thank you letters, and then they hired me to be a fundraiser, uh, which was great. And then I decided I kind of wanted to see a different part of the world. So I took a job as a fundraiser on the other side of the country for an organization, which seemed great until my first two paychecks bounced. And I had moved everything I owned in my little Datsun across the country, and I didn't have a job and I didn't have a place to live. So that, that, you know, that, that's a big curve on here, right? Uh, so then I tempt, and my, the job I got as a temp was to organize complaints to an insurance company. Also not quite what I had had in mind when I graduated. Uh, then I was a youth worker for at-risk teens. It's like, does that fit in? I don't know. Well, um, then I was staffed to an articulation committee. So articulation is if any of you are transfer transfers, somebody had to decide how the class you had taken at your first university transferred to the second one. And that's called an articulation agreement. So I was staffed to a committee of universities who were thinking about transfer agreements. Uh, then I had one that probably does look like what you would think maybe I did, and that is I was a nonprofit CEO for a while. Uh, then I was a high school math teacher. 
Uh, then I got a job as an economic and workforce development program director. So I was working in a rural area, helping them think about jobs of the future and what uh, skills the workforce would need in that area. Then I was a Girl Scout cookie campaign coordinator. Uh, then kind of go, you know, looks a little more reasonable. I was a regional STEM association director. Then I was a coach for university teams who are trying to transform curriculum. And I'm where I am now. This is not your normal, well, it is probably your normal career path, but it's not the career path I thought I was going on. And uh, I hate to tell you this, but many of you are going to have careers that kind of look like this, right? For various reasons. Things happen, right? Economies change. Uh, you end up moving because of your own desires or your family's plans. Uh, you decide to take time either off or part time because you want, want to take care of kids. All kinds of different things happen. And there's reasons why I got all of these jobs that made sense. But it is not what I had in mind at all. This is not what I thought I would be looking back at uh, at this point. It was very confusing. It is still very confusing sometimes, right? But what I have seen about that is that none of that was wasted. What I get to do now is I get to work with, with individuals and companies who work in all kinds of jobs. So how perfect is that, right? I, mean, I have exactly the right background for what I do now because there's almost nothing that someone comes to one of my trainings that I haven't done something that's kind of like it because I've worked in all kinds of groups. But for a long time, I looked at that list and went, <laughs> okay, Liz, no, you really screwed up here. But none of it was wasted. So that's the first thing I want to say is that for those of you who are feeling like, I don't know where I'm going to end up, it's okay. It's okay. So I'm going to do a little exercise to kind of start off. And I need 10 volunteers. I had dinner with some students last night. And they promised me they would be among the 10. But there's room for a few more. So I need 10. I need you up here. And um, you will not be too embarrassed. Maybe slightly embarrassed, but not too embarrassed. OK? So come on up. OK, there's a few. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, we need five more. Six, seven, okay. Eight, okay. Get there. Nine, okay. Do we have ten? Let's see here. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Excellent. Okay. All right. So we're going to do an exercise that's called point the finger. Okay. So, uh, and the rest of you are going to be able to kind of um, not give, maybe give advice. I might ask you to give advice at some point, but you're going to be able to see what they do. So what I need is I need you to uh, have five people here and then five people here facing them. So one row of five, one row of five facing each other. Okay. Scoot your table back a little bit here. Ooh, it's okay. Okay. All right. Sorry. Whoop. The secret is out. There are books underneath. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. We have five, five. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. You lost somebody. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Not getting away that easy. Okay. So the game's called point the finger because I'm going to ask you to do this. Okay. So can, let me make sure you can all do this. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you to get a little bit closer to each other. And what I'm going to do in a minute here is I'm going to put this pole so that it's resting on top of your fingers. Okay. Uh, and about this high. Okay. And then your job is to lower the stick to the ground. Um, there's two rules. The first rule is that your finger has to stay in contact with the stick at all times. Okay? I'll be the judge, but all of you too, if you see somebody, their finger slips off, yell, okay? Because then they have to start over. Okay? The second rule is that you can't go like this or like this or in some way kind of put other pressure. It has to just rest on your finger. Okay? Everybody understand the two rules? Okay. 
Has anybody done this before? We need to get a substitute. Okay, all right. And I'm, so I'm gonna rest it here on the, your fingers, and you might need to get a, bit, a little bit closer together here. Ignore the string, it's just, okay. Okay, and I'll, I will say one, two, three, go, okay? Everybody ready? One, two, three, go. No, I saw a finger slip. I'm not going to say uh -oh. who it was. Okay, okay, okay. Hold on, hold on. Okay, one, two, three, go. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, maybe we need clearer instructions here. <laughs> So the task is very simple. The task is to get the stick to go down, which is that direction, okay? Everybody clear? Okay, let's try it again. Okay, one, two, three, go. Down, 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 down. <laughs> okay, um, okay, uh, let's see. Do you wanna talk about it a little bit and see if you can like, Sort out a way to do this, maybe? This is great. This is a great strategy. Can we, like, can we, the same, can like, we have right? our fingers together? Like, so there's, there's two rules. You have to make that it has to maintain, it has to stay on your finger. Okay, and you can't go like that. Those are the two rules. Okay? Yeah, yeah, can we like can't, go? Can't we work? Can we? Okay, all right, okay, okay. You want to try that? Okay, all right, let's try that. Or angled. So, so, okay, so bring your, bring your fingers up a little bit to start the same. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three, go. Oh, 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 I saw somebody break, saw somebody break there, okay. Okay, better, a little better, you want to try it again? Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> okay. One, two, three, go. Um, I thought I thought we had licked that up yeah. down problem. Okay. Like this. Okay. We're like. Yeah. Okay. One, two, three. Adam, you're right on the edge there oh. of doing this thing. Like, not okay. Oh, oh, okay, almost close, close, okay. Okay, so, so when I do this in training, so we start all of our trainings this way, we do this. And I ask a question that they have a hard time with, but you all should have an easier time with because it has not been so long since you were in high school. Um, uh, so do you remember high school geometry? Sort of, kind of, right, okay. Um, so what does this, what geometric, form does this remind you of? A line, okay. Uh, what's the official definition of a line in geometry? Anybody remember? It goes on forever. It does, true. How do you define a line? Slope. Yeah, that's more math, but how do you know you have a line? What, what, what do you need to have to have a line? No slope. Eh, not necessarily. Two points. two points, right? Two points is what defines a line, right? Okay. Um, how many points do you have right now? Ten. Is there a way you can get it down to two? Yeah, I'll go on. Try it. I'm not going to twist it, but. Like but no, no, well, I mean, you can, you know, five. Five on this side, five on that side. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay, okay, five. Okay, can we have five on this side? Okay, all right. Okay, five on this side. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna put it here. So fingers close together. Okay, ready? One, two, three, go. Close enough, close enough. I will count it, I will count it. All right, thank you. All right, so it's a very simple task. Get the stick to the ground. 
What happened when they tried it at first? Did it go straight down to the ground? Did it? It went up. You know what? It always goes up. I've only had one time that it didn't go up. I've probably done it a hundred times, okay? Once it went down, but it always goes up. Why does it go up? You can answer if you were one of the 10 or if you were somebody else. Why does it go up? Yeah, Brandon, it looks like you had something to say. People are scared of losing touch, right, right? People listen very well to the rules and they're thinking, I wanna make sure I pay attention to the rules, right? Anybody else have a... So we had a, a very much a, a variety of heights here. We had at least one person who was very tall, one person who was shorter. Sometimes groups want to blame one of those people. It's your fault, the tall one, <laughs> or it's your fault, the short one, okay? That's not part of it. Uh, you 10, was anybody intentionally sabotaging the process? You came up here and you're like, I know what I'm gonna do. I don't care what she says, I'm gonna make sure it doesn't work. Anybody doing that? No. no. The reason we start our trainings with this is because this is one example, a really simple model of a system where you have to get multiple points of contact to all do something together. But no one can tell you, no one, I can't tell the 10 really how to do it, right? I can tell them what the goal is, but then they have to figure out how to get the system to move. That's really their job. I can give hints, but it's their job, right? And that is very much what working in networks is like. It's a system and you have, it's a different way of thinking. Systems thinking, which you may have heard in some of your courses, is about looking at the bigger picture and figuring out how to get a bigger picture or a system of things to move in alignment. And that's different than many of the ways we are taught in classes about the way companies and organizations work. But how is it that they finally got it to go down? What did they do? Dr. Martin said I could pick on somebody, but I don't want to do it. Somebody want to volunteer? <laughs> what did they finally do? Yeah. Five on one end, five on the other end, right? This is the thing about, this is the other thing about systems, is simple rules. The way to move systems is to have a few simple rules. That is counterintuitive because we think if it's a complex system, it must need a complex solution. And that's actually not true. You just need a few simple rules. That's why we use this. So I wanna give you a couple of things that you might want to think about. So this is um, an article that was, uh, it's old at this point, but it's still very much true. So this is a, from an article called Strategy with Simple Rules. So, and her, and it's uh, uh, Kathleen Eisenhart and Donald Soule. And their contention is that in the new economy, which now is not that new, but in 2001 was new, uh, that was going to require a different way of working because there were going to be unanticipated things that came up and that what was needed in that situation was a handful of simple rules rather than trying to respond to the, com the complicatedness with lots of complexity. So this is just kind of a simple example of that. It's a simple model of that, that, that just a simple rule, five on one side, five on the other side, two points, can make it go down is, is the way to go. And that's true in many, many complex systems. Uh, let me hold off here. Okay, so I'm, let me ask a question that I'm sure the answer is yes for almost everybody. Do you have your phone? Excellent, take it out. here come back there we go I'm gonna ask you to go to menti.com on your phone if you got a laptop you can do that too uh, and enter the code at the top and here's the here's the prompt your professor just told you 50% of your grade for some class is based on a team project you do not get to pick your team your reaction in three words or less so go ahead and do it and it will pop up here so
And this is anonymous, so if, if you're thinking of a prof particular professor, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. <laughs> Bummer, annoyed, confused, anxious, cry. Oh, I like cry, okay. Dismayed, awkward, yikes, yes. We have an emoji here. Okay, so nobody likes this, right? And this happens in our class. And guess what? Your professors hate it just as much, actually, right? I mean, that's the, that's the truth often. Because for professors, I mean, we know it's a good way for students to learn. But it is a hassle. Professors spend a lot of their time dealing with teams that are having trouble figuring out how to work together. Oh, boy, we have lots of feelings about this, don't we? That's good. OK, OK. We have lots of, lots of feelings about this, right? Doesn't, doesn't, in reality, even though it's a good learning experience, according to all the pedagogical rules, I'm sure I could ask your dean, he would say, yes, team projects are a pain in the you know where, right? Yeah. And research actually backs this up and even makes it worse, if that is possible. Because what the research says is that when you have bad experiences in team projects in the school, this is actually a higher education research project. If you have a less than satisfying experience, I think we can say safely that that word cloud said less than satisfying experience, right? Uh, it discourages students from active participation in future groups. And it has a negative impact on the transfer of teamwork skills from education to workplace environments. Wow. Kind of makes you think maybe we should stop making you do that, huh? <laughs> no, <laughs> I hate, uh, sorry, I hate to tell you that. That's probably not going to happen. But there are better ways to have teams, probably. Because I think what, what most of us assume is, is, is that somehow we assume that when you arrive on campus, you magically know how to work in teams. Uh, because you must have done that in high school, and that's true, but it probably wasn't any better there, right? So why would we think you magically know how to do it in college? Of course not. Okay? And if we, if we give you a bad experience in college, you're going to get into the workplace and not necessarily do any better there either. So we need to figure out how to fix that. Okay, get back on your phones here. Here's the next question. Switch off. Which is more important to employers? Hard skills or soft skills? Pop it up here and switch it. Oh, okay, there we go. Hard skills, by that I mean like specific things you learn to do in school, like accounting or web design or whatever, uh, or soft skills, your socio-emotional abilities, or are they equally important? I think you're close to everybody there. Okay. So I'm going to ask one person from each uh, of these uh, segments to kind of make the case. So somebody who voted for hard skills are what are more important, that 14. One of the 14, who wants to say in one sentence, why do you think that's true? Make the case. Yeah. That's why you get paid. You get hired for your hard skills. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's hear from somebody who said soft skills. So there's 51 of you. Who's one of you want to, in one sentence, why do you think that is what employers are looking for? Yeah. They want you to work together in the whole company. Yeah, OK. And uh, we've got 34 people who say they're equally important. Who wants to, in one sentence, why is that true? Yeah. Um, I said that because I think that like as um, you get like hard projects, you also need to like know how to ask for help and work with people on them. And OK. Ask a manager. So I think they're equally important. So you need to use your hard skills, but you might need to use the soft skills really to get it done, right? OK, OK. So there's, there's an actual answer to this. You may not agree with what the survey says, but, but I can tell you what the survey said. Sixty-one percent said they are not looking for hard skills. They're looking for soft skills. 
So I've got the, I, 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 what, I should have put what's not more important. So 61% said soft skills are more important than hard skills. 61 is a lot. And when they asked them what they meant, here's what they said. Teamwork, number one, communication, time management, problem solving, creativity, leadership, organization, emotional intelligence, decision making, stress management. That's what employers are looking for. So even though you are in courses where you're learning, you know, accounting or financial planning or uh, HR management or whatever it is you're in, um, what your employers would most like you to have is this, actually, because they can teach you the other stuff. But it is really hard to teach this if you didn't come in with it. It's possible, but they would much rather send you to school to learn the hard stuff. So let me tell you about a change that's happened. And this is no surprise to all of you, given your age. But if you asked your parents and your grandparents about the organizations they've worked in, they will explain to you that they worked in an organization that had an org chart that was a hierarchy. And there was one org person at the top who did lots of thinking, and they told everybody else what to do. There still are in a lot of organizations, there are org charts for sure, but they don't describe a lot of what happens anymore in an organization. What describes organizations instead are networks. There's a big difference between these two things, right? A hierarchy has a top and a bottom. A network does not. Like I say, you all are kind of network natives. You're just used to work, seeing the world this way. But when you go into the world of work, you're working with people who don't necessarily. They're still kind of thinking in hierarchies. And networks are kind of complicated. Uh, networks do have kind of a hub. That's that big red circle. Uh, and there's a few people who are kind of at the center. And if you think about, well, what, what is that hub? So that hub could be a technology that a company has invented. It could be a person, even. It could be an idea. It could be a place. There's lots of things. It could be the hub. But it's kind of what's the resource or what's the thing of value that people have gathered around in the network? And so there's people who are very tightly connected to that. And then there's other people who are somehow connected, but not quite so closely. Uh, and the boundary between those two is kind of porous. People can kind of come back and forth in between. And there's no network that exists by itself. Every network exists in relationship to other networks. So for example, uh, you may, whatever your, uh, you're all in the College of Business and Economics, in some ways, that's a network. There is a hierarchy in terms of, you know, we have the dean and the dean has people he reports to, but the whole school taken as a whole really is a network because he can't tell you what to do, right? No, some days you think that would be great, right? Uh, and education in general doesn't really <laughs> work this way, right? Uh, right, but you know, there's, there's, in general, it's a network, uh, but it's not the only network you're in. Right, you know, there's there's these other. Let's see if I can get it to do it. Go, will it do, will it do it? Sort of. It's very light here. There's this other network over here. So maybe you're part of a student organization. Maybe you're part of some volunteer thing that you do. There's some other network that you are part of. So you are part of multiple networks. You're a boundary spanner. And if for example, Dr. Martin and I are talking about this in the car on the way home, uh, on the way from our thing this morning, she was talking about how she, um, this morning, she met someone who used to, who graduated about 30 years ago from the program here. And she's thinking about, well, how could we get that person re-engaged, right? So they are at a company now, but they're also kind of part of this network. But right now, they're way out here. They haven't had any real connection to the university for a long time. So she's thinking about, hmm, their boundary spanner. Oh, well, come here. They're a boundary spanner, and how can I use them to connect the company to the college? And in networks, that's kind of how things get done. Things get done by making connections and helping people see value in contributing to what a network's doing. So here's an example. 
Let's have a moment of silence for what this is. Some of you, maybe your parents have one. Okay, this is the very first iPod. So the iPod was what they had before iPads and iPhones. This is the very first one. Uh, who makes this? Apple. Sort of. This is the actual network map of the team that made the very first iPod. You can see the red dot in the middle is Apple, but there's all these other companies involved. Any surprises? Yeah, in the green right here. Here's what's, what, what's something that's surprising up here? Um, the car companies. Car companies. Why is that surprising to you? Yeah, especially back then, right? There was no such thing as like plugging your music into your car. There was no Bluetooth. Before Bluetooth, there, there was a thing before Bluetooth where you had an MP3 player and there was a jack that you used. But when the first iPod came out, neither of those existed yet. So yeah, there's some car companies. There's a BMW and a Volkswagen, yeah. So Apple could see, they had this vision of like someday with this thing that we're making, Someday, people are going to be able to use that in their cars. We're not sure how exactly, but let's invite some car companies in to help with this project. What else is surprising here? Yeah. Uh, competitors like Samsung. Samsung, Microsoft, yeah. Yeah, there's something about this project that was so compelling that Apple thought they needed them and that the competitors were willing to do it. Anything else is surprising? Here's one that's often surprising. Let's see, where is it? Ah, oh, there it is. I have to go looking for it. Kate Spade. What the heck is Kate Spade doing there? You know? Design, maybe cases, hard to say. There's also all these music connections. I mean, remember, this was before I mean, when, when the first iPod came out, people were still in the business of going to music stores and buying a CD. This stuff was just starting. But Apple, again, could see like, oh, we're gonna need a way, I mean, we have the hardware, but we're gonna need a way for people to actually put things on the hardware that they want. Okay, let's get these brand new music companies in here. So this is, this is the network that put it together. And it was only for this project. By the time the second iPod came out, probably some of these companies had either decided they didn't see any value in being part of it, or Apple had decided they didn't see any point in being part of it, or they disappeared, like the green Napster up there. Maybe some of you have heard of Napster. It was around for a while, it's gone. It's been gone for a long time. So maybe they were gone by then, I don't know, okay? But this is, it's a voluntary network. People come in, people go out. Steve Jobs could not force Bill Gates to come be a part of this network. Bill Gates had to decide there was value in it for Microsoft. And that's the way networks happen. There is no, there's nobody on top kind of directing them. So the problem is networks cannot be directed, but they can be guided. So that's what we spend our work doing is helping people learn ways to guide networks because in some way they are working with a group where they can't tell everybody what to do. It might be that uh, it's a group of uh, often we get called in to work with a group in a region, you know, and the people don't all work for the same organization, but they really care about their community or their region and they want to see good things happen. There's nobody in charge. Nobody can tell what them what to do. Sometimes it's different units within an organization. Uh, and technically, I suppose the CEO could tell everybody what to do, but the CEO has better things to do. And so the CEO just says, figure it out. You know, you, you're a special team working on this thing, figure it out. But they don't have any rules for how to do that. So those are the kinds of projects that we get called about, can you help us find ways to do this kind of work together? So uh, the word for working together that you've all heard of in your books, I'm sure, is collaboration. And collaboration is one of those words that, oh my gosh, do we use it in just really sloppy ways? Okay? We use collaboration to mean almost anything. 
So we, what we say is collaboration is really there's a spectrum of behavior that is collaborative. And it tends to sort of work across time. So let me give you some examples. So at the very sort of beginning of when you first meet someone, mutual awareness. We acknowledge each other. Oh, hi. You're Nick. I'm Liz. Good to meet you. OK. This is not collaboration. I think we would all agree, right? Second one is exploration. OK. We share information. Oh, tell me what you're doing. OK, I'll tell you what I'm doing. OK, it's better. We have a little bit more of a relationship, but it is not collaboration. Here's where it gets tricky, cooperation. We're going to share resources. This happens a lot in the nonprofit world because we say, uh, let's go get a grant, and you get half, and I'll get half, and we'll tell the funder that we're collaborating because that's what the funder wants us to do. If you're thinking about going to nonprofit, you will see this <laughs> dynamic a lot because it happens a lot. That is not collaboration. That's just sharing resources or cooperating at best. Uh, then there's teamwork, a little better. We're going to co-execute. So some of you, if you have project teams that work pretty well, you might say, well, we co-executed a project. We took turns. We split up the work. We worked as a team, which is better for sure. But what you really want to get to, if you really want to create something that's going to change people's lives, whether that's in a company or an organization or as an entrepreneur, whatever, because there's no entrepreneur that does it by themselves, what you want to get to is co-creation. And that's different. So we would say that collaboration is co-creation. But two things have to happen if you want that. The first is that turf has to go down. And by turf, I mean uh, people feeling like they have to protect what's theirs and they can't be generous with what they have because it might cost them something. And the opposite, trust has to take its place, that we trust each other. We trust each other to get work done together. But if you want real co-creation, that's what you need to have happen. So those of you who have already been in the work world for a while have probably already seen plenty of examples of uh, people who don't trust each other, people who, who sort of guard their own resources in ways that are not helpful to the organization as a whole. And that keeps them, that holds that company back from being able to do really good work together. But those habits are pretty hard to break, I would say. Okay. So the work that we do, it's called strategic doing. Someday you'll get asked to be on a strategic planning committee and I recommend you say no. Uh, <laughs> because strategic planning committee, the word planning sometimes means like we're going to plan for a year. And in our organization, we say, stop, let's just do together. Enough conversation, let's just get moving. Okay. So that's, that's kind of why it's called strategic doing. Uh, it's a strategy discipline or process or procedure or whatever you want to call it. It's designed for those networks where nobody can really tell anybody what to do. And it's designed to get people together quickly in action oriented ways of working together to move them towards outcomes that can be measured and to make adjustments along the way. The idea is that they start working together and doing things from day one rather than spending six months planning and then maybe starting to do something. Okay. Here comes the metaphor. Okay. We're done with the big ideas. We're on to the metaphor. Okay. Metaphor is a trail. We use the metaphor of a trail a lot uh, because it's a pretty good um, stand in for the kind of work that you're doing when you're co-creating, because when you're co-creating, you're not exactly sure how it's all going to go. And think about the iPod. It didn't exist before when Apple called that group together. They weren't exactly sure. I mean, they had an idea, but a lot of the details still had to be filled in. So we use the, the metaphor of a, a trail guide because there's that same sense of you don't, ex I mean, you know where you're going, but there's a little bit of the unexpected about it, right? Any hikers in the room? Okay. Any else? Anybody else? Maybe, kind of, my parents, maybe, I was in Boy Scouts, whatever. Okay. The first step in uh, being a trail guide is gathering the group that wants to go on the trail, right? So gathering. 
me tell you about what for us that means. For us, gathering is gathering a group around a question. And it's a question that is positive, that's appreciative, that is not about a problem. So maybe some of you growing up had rooms that looked like this. Maybe some of you still have rooms that look like this. I'm not going to ask and I'm not going to judge, OK? But one of my coworkers had a child who they had a lot of arguments about what the room looked like. And one day my colleague Scott, he said, I'm going to, what would I do if this would work? Because he was like, he was always getting these fights with his, with his child. He thought, what would I do if it would work? And he said, I guess I would ask a better question rather than go clean up your room. <laughs> like maybe we'd ask a question and it would not be, why haven't you cleaned up your room? That's not the kind of question I mean. So this is the question he asked, how would your life be different if your room was almost always clean? I don't know about you, but his child looked at him and said, Dad, why are you asking this question? What's up? What's the agenda here? Why are you asking? But this is the kind of gathering question that if you're going to be a trail guide, which I recommend that you be a trail guide, that gathers people and helps them see a future that they want. Because Scott, my colleague, said, no, 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 I really want to know. How would your life be different if your room was almost always clean? And his child said, well, you wouldn't tell me no all the time. And his dad said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you're always saying, no, you can't go to the movies on Sunday because you haven't cleaned your room. No, you can't have people over because you haven't cleaned your room. We were all, you're always telling me no because of my room. And Scott said, fair enough, OK. So this question helped. The child's like, okay, here's something different that I want. Here's a hike I would like to go on. It's not like the room magically got better, but they stopped having arguments about it. And Scott ha stopped having to say no all the time. So that an appreciative question is one that focuses on opportunities, not on problems, and helps people see a future that they might want. You can do this no matter what position you're in in an organization because you will always have the opportunity to ask questions. And the kinds of questions you ask can shape the conversations you have with coworkers, with your boss, with almost anybody, and help people see a future that you want them to go on with you in some way. Here's another example. So, actually, no, I'm gonna skip that one. Yeah, let's get that one. This is actually, this is also one of Scott's stories. Uh, so Scott teaches at Purdue, which is where our center used to be. And uh, a couple of years ago, Scott had a baseball player in his one of his classes on the baseball team. And um, this kid was pretty serious about baseball. I was thinking about, you know, going pro maybe someday. And in those kinds of um, scenarios, the, any baseball players in here? Any? A few, okay. So the deal is, if you're serious about this and you're a collegiate player, you go play for a, a summer league that is particularly sort of focused on college players. Um, but you know, it's not like it's not like you just send your resume out, right? <laughs> you need your coach to kind of help you do that. And his coach was like not getting it done, even though this player was quite good. The coach was just not not doing what the coach needed to do to make it happen. So this, this player was in Scott's class, and so they talked about this idea of appreciative questions. And so the students started thinking, like, okay, so what is the question I could ask my coach? And he decided that the question was, hey, coach. It was probably phrased a little bit differently than this, but hey, coach, imagine if I had an amazing summer playing league ball in wherever. Wouldn't that be great? And the coach was like, Actually, yeah, that would be great. I mean, it's kind of a no brainer. But asking the question in that way, you know, it wasn't like, hey, coach, you haven't done what you needed to do. Or, hey, coach, you know, I, I can't do this. I need you. It was helping the coach see something that they wanted and buying in. The coach is like, yeah, that's what I want to see for my players. I want to see my players develop. And that means I need to somehow figure out how to get this kid into a summer league. I'll tell you the end of the story in a little bit. But. So the secret formula for good questions 
is, and you, this is, uh, you can take a picture if you want. This, uh, this truly is kind of the secret formula. If you can't think of a different way to say it, is to say, imagine if, and then to say the setting, not the problem, the setting. You know, imagine if I, as a college player, and were, and then desired state, what if I were having an amazing season this summer in a summer league? What would that look like? Not the problem, the setting and what you want the future to be. This idea has like changed my professional life. It really has. This completely changes the conversations you have with bosses and coworkers and customers for that matter. And you were going into sales, this question. Okay, gather people for a hike. Now we're gonna talk about leading. And I think the original title for this was leading from day one, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about three different kinds of leading that are applicable. The first kind of leading is leading from alongside. Okay, you're on the hike with people, right? You have coworkers. And when you're a trail guide, you're going on the, you're going on the hike and it's not like you're in like a helicopter watching them go on the hike. You're with them, right? You are just another hiker for the most part. So there are some opportunities to lead that come when you're just walking along the trail with everybody else. And those opportunities, one of the places those opportunities happen is in making decisions. So I'm going to give you a secret about making decisions. I want you to think for a minute. Let's, okay, Adam, I need everybody to have a post-it if they don't already. And I want you to write down on your post-it. So if you don't have a post-it yet, raise your hand, Adam, make sure you get one. And if you don't have a writing implement, we have a bunch of those too. And I want you to write down on a Sharpie how many jelly beans you think are in here. How many jelly beans do you think are in here? Estimate. These are normal jelly beans, okay? There's like, this is not like a magic jelly bean picture, okay? These are normal jelly beans. I actually hired a photographer for, to fill up a container with jelly beans and count them and take a picture. So. So write down how many jelly beans you think are in the container. Okay. Okay. So after you've written down your guess, I want you to pair up with somebody and I'm going to ask you to do a little bit math. Calculate the mean, the average of your two guesses, which is your guess plus your friends. Take the sum, divide it by two. And write that number down on your post it. So you've got your guess and then the mean. Okay. Okay. Who needs more time? Okay, you got about 15 seconds. So calculate the mean, you and a friend. You don't have to argue about it, just find the mean. Okay? And then I want you to go into Menti and put your individual guess in. I will tell you it is between 200 and 1,000, and Menti will let you do it, I think, in increments of 10.
So put your guess in here. Okay. The actual answer, 770. Okay. 770 is, it's actually 767, but we'll call it 770. Okay. What we've just done, and so take a look at your guess, your guess with someone else. And then the guess of the whole group. And I can tell you that 90% of the time, the guess of the entire group is closer than if we took the difference of everybody, how far away they were, right? So a group, even though nobody in this room knows, except me, knows how many jelly beans are in there, the group as a whole can actually get pretty close, even if nobody knows exactly. This is called group intuition. There's lots of research behind it. So this is a leadership skill when you're just walking along the path and you have a group that needs to make a decision. Like, you know what? We None of us know the exact answer. All of us together can come pretty close if we talk about it. It seems kind of like, like really? But there's like, I, if you want, I can give you research articles, uh, <laughs> right? But it is an amazing thing that a group together, even if nobody knows exactly, can usually come pretty close. You wouldn't want one person, like if you decided one person should make the decision and you picked that person, you're in trouble. If you pick that person, you're in trouble. But with 100 people putting in guesses, you can usually come reasonably close. Not exactly, but reasonably close. Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. Oh, come back here. Okay. okay, so that is along the trail. I'll skip that. Then there's leading from the back. So all of you in your first jobs are probably kind of leading from the back, right? You are not the CEO, you're not the assistant CEO. You're right now, maybe you're an intern. And when you're first hired, maybe you're the like several orders down on the picking order. So what does it mean to lean from the back? One thing it means is to help people have, think about the back. The back is the stragglers on the hike, right? But one thing you can do as a leader is to help the people in the back catch up. Right? And in, in group terms, part of what that means is helping people have a safe space to contribute. So there's words for that called psychological safety and trust, but that's something you can do whether you're the leader or not. One way you can do that is by being a good participant and modeling that for other people. And if you are leading the conversation at some point, you can even make this happen. So there's a study about this. So about the, so this is an actual um, three different groups of people. And somebody sat there with a stopwatch and timed how much people talked. How many people have ever been in a group like this one? I call this Mr. Blue Bar. He talked 70% of the time. Nobody else really had a chance to get in. Anybody ever been in that group? Yeah, okay, yeah, right. So how many people in this, this group? There's a couple of people that talk, and then there's one person, like they say their name at the beginning, and they never say anything else. A few people have been there? A few people probably are one of those people, right? So the research says that this is the most effective kind of group. Everybody talks about the same amount. It's called equity of voice. And that's something you can do that creates trust in a group that everyone can trust they will be heard 
And almost more important, nobody in the group wants to see this person doing this. So if you can create a different kind of dynamic, everyone in the group feels safer. So it's like, oh good, someone is dealing with Mr. Blue Bar. Thank you. But you can, you don't have to slam the person. You can just say, hey, you know what I've read? I've read that groups are most effective when everybody talks about the same amount. So why don't we see if that, we can do that today. You don't have to be a jerk about it. But that can create a very different kind of dynamic. So go back to Menti for a minute. And tell me what kind of group participant you are. Are you the kind of person that maybe I'll introduce myself, that's over here, or you're Mr. Blue Bar. Talk, 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 talk. Most people know themselves pretty well. Is it not working? Hmm. Let's see if I can do something about that. What's it saying? It just asks the question, but there's no option no Oh, I wonder why that is. OK. We will punt. How many of you think you are on the side of Mr. Blue Bar? Maybe not all the way over there, but you know you are a person who, who tends to talk a lot in groups. OK. How many of you are sort of closer over here where you know you're the kind of person who just doesn't say much, right? I encourage, if you're the person who's over here, I encourage you to tone it down a little bit sometimes, not all the time, you know. And if you're over here, take a little more risks, particularly if your group is working on something complicated. Your group needs equity of voice to get hard stuff done. Okay. Then last is leading from the front. When you are in charge, which is a glorious thing, and someday you will have the opportunity to do that. If not on day one, you will have the opportunity. The most important thing you can do from the front is to help everybody get something done. And there's a really easy way to do that. And it has to do with getting your pointer to work. Okay. It's called making sure you have an action plan before you walk out of the room. And in your action plan, every single person commits to having something to do specific that has a deliverable and has a deadline. You will be amazed if you haven't yet been in lots of work meetings, you will be amazed how many meetings walk out without any of this. Everybody says, oh, that was a really good conversation. See you next week. We don't have time for that, folks. <laughs> I don't have time for that, right? But if you do this, everybody will walk out of the meeting going, that was an amazingly effective meeting. We got a lot done. That kind of leadership gets you promoted real quick. That's, that's one of those soft skills of being able to get people to do this. Okay. But it needs to be real specific. Who's going to do what with a deliverable? This is key. So like, OK, Nick, Nick says, OK, I'm gonna, so I'll, I'll draft that poster that we want to get out. Okay, great. What's the deliverable? Um, so I'm going to upload the poster to Dropbox and everybody can take a look at it. Okay. When are you going to do that? Oh, I'll do that in two weeks. Okay, great. That's an action item. Making sure everybody in a group does that. That's leading from the front. That is very unusual, unfortunately, but very effective. Okay, so we've talked about behind, in front, beside. Let's talk about that. Okay, let me tell you the story, the end of the story with the baseball player. Okay. What do you think the coach did? What do you think the player did? The player helped the coach set up an action item. The player said, yeah, yeah, I want to help. And the player said, okay. So are, are there a couple people you can call? And the coach said, oh yeah, I can call this team, this team. Okay, great. 
When do you think you could do that by? I'll do that by next week. Great. And could you email me after you have those conversations so they know they happened? And the coach was like, uh, yeah, I guess I could do that. <laughs> guess what? The student had a team to play for the next week. So the, the player was not a jerk about it. He just asked those questions. OK, the coach is the, the who. Let's get specific about what the what is. Let's figure out what the deliverable is, and let's find the deadline. And you know, obviously, the player was not in a position to order the coach to do it, right? But he made it easy for the coach to say yes to what he already wanted to do. He helped the coach see the future. Imagine if I had a great, I had a great job this summer, and then helped him get there. And I think that's the end of what we have. Except we'll never know. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, we're not going to do that. Okay. Oh, that actually is my summary. No, it's not. Okay. I'm going to stop right there. You don't need the bear. Okay. So your path is going to be, who knows what it's going to look like. It could look like mine. It's like all over the place. But no matter what, you can be a guide. You can be a trail guide from the front, beside, or behind. And you can help gather people by asking good questions that help them see a future that they didn't know about yet, or they hadn't realized they wanted to get to. And you can do that now in whatever jobs you're in. And you can do that from the very first day of your new career. I wish you all amazing success. I'm happy to answer questions, whether it's about uh, the book or my career or one of these things or anything else. I'm happy to, happy to answer. So it's terrific to see you all. Well, let's um, thank Ms. Wilson for her talk. And we're going to proceed to the drawing, and yep. then Ms. Wilson will stay for a couple minutes. Yeah, I'm happy to come down. Yeah, and yeah, I'm happy to stay, stick around. Uh, so would you mind putting pulling, pulling up the Q code? code? Yes, let's see here. So you'll need your phones one more time. Let's see here. I know I saw it. Let's see here. Nick, you put it up here? Is that right? On the desktop. On the desktop. Okay, there we go. Let's see here. I don't even know where the desktop is. You're going to have to tell me. I don't have a Windows computer, obviously. Oh, sorry. You shrink, shrink that. Okay, let me up. shrink that, yeah. yeah. Shrink and shrink that. that. Okay, there you go. And there it is. Okay. Grab your phone. So I'm also happy to, if anybody wants to uh, connect on LinkedIn, I know that's something Dr. Martin tells students that they should do. I'm happy to do it. I never say no to anybody unless you're trying to sell me something. So if you have some kind of scheme, don't bother, but otherwise I'm always happy to. Um, yeah, and you can be in touch that way. All right, we're getting the first few responses. Just give us a second here. Can I hand out books? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So writing a book was a great adventure. I encourage you all to do it at some point. It is completely doable. Well, you had help. <laughs> I did have help, and you can have help too. I had, there were five of us that wrote it together. Um, but it was an amazing feeling to get, to get those first books in a box. Like, we did this. It was an amazing thing. Yeah, it was. You, sh you should. <laughs> What's stopping you, right? Our dean just finished writing an accounting textbook. And... Mm -hmm. I know. I'm like... Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. It was a lot of, he and another author, it was a lot of, a lot of time. Okay, we're ready. Ready? I can hand out books? Okay, excellent. Drum roll, okay. We're randomizing the entries, yeah. Yeah, we do this too, yeah. And we've tried to make the book an easy read. Those of you who have, Dr. Martin has read it. I don't know about anybody else, but we've tried to make it pretty accessible. Okay. Adam's read it. Okay. Yeah. A couple of people. So there is like, you know, researchy stuff, but it's all in the back. <laughs> we kept it out of the main text. So. Olivia, come on down. You're the next winner. Okay. Keep going, Nick. Now keep going. We've got nine books. Got nine books. Nine books. Happy reading. Who's next? Lots of tension. <laughs> Olivia Anderson. Well, okay. If your name's Olivia, you're getting a book. Okay. Happy reading. Tiffany Fiber. The women are cleaning up here. Okay. Bias. <laughs> Is Tiffany here? Do you have to be present to win? Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. It might be an online person. Probably. Tiffany, if you won, don't worry. We'll figure that out. What's the first name? Henry. Henry. Henry, are you here? No? Okay. I'll set aside one for Henry. Yeah, it could... Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. What do we want to do? Anna Trzynski. Anna. Anna. Okay. Come on down, Anna. Okay. What else we got? Okay. Kristen what? Kristen what? Kristen, okay. Online, maybe? Okay. Okay. Those online people, I know. If you are online, maybe you're still on. I hope you're still on. If you're online and you won, I will make sure you get a book. What is it? All right. So if you're online and you won, we didn't, we didn't say you had to be here. I'll make sure you get a book. We can do that. We have lots of them, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. We'll figure it out. Adrian Shenke. Come on down, Adrian. Okay. My favorite names. My younger son is an Adrian. Sure thing. Okay. What else we got? Squeaky shoe here. Connor Beckard. Connor Beckard. Okay. The men are catching up. Okay. Uh, three more. Because I'll deal with the. The, the online people. <laughs> Not only do you get credit, you get a book. Sure. Adam. Adam. Okay, another Adam. Another Adam. There you go. Okay, last one. Last one. See you, Joe. Last chance. Sure. Harmony Hoffman. Harmony Hoffman. Harmony. Dang. Okay. One more chance. Don't worry. One more chance. Maxine. Maxine Dehan. Ah, okay. There we go. All right. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Happy reading. Happy reading. Check out. Thank you so much for coming.